Good afternoon, everyone. Before we begin our ceremony today, our memorial ceremony, I wanted to be sure of a few things. First of all, uh, please, if you have a mobile phone with you, I will do the same. Please make sure that it's uh, silenced. You don't need to turn it off, but please be sure that it is in the silent position. We will uh, have the ability to share a lot uh, with one another when, and share those people who are trying to reach, reach us, we'll reach them later. And also, you may notice that many people are still wearing masks in our community, and we just wanted to be sure that we're all sensitive to their needs and the needs of anyone, really, who is still worried about distance from one another. So just be, please be sure to be respectful for, uh, for people's, uh, people's distances. In our tradition, the nigun, the melody without words, is considered to be a powerful spiritual tool. It can help to create a container uh, for all that we might be bringing to a space where we're gathering, all of the emotions and the intentions. I'm gonna offer a nigun just to kind of help us all to fully arrive and gather and open our hearts to everything that we may do and say here. Yiddi <laughs> Good afternoon. I think that Julius's spirit is with us here today. For those people who knew him here at Temple Bethel, or those people who knew him in his community, or those people who knew him at UW, we mourn with you, we grieve with you. And certainly to Hildy, who misses him so much. To Jean and David and Mary Beth and Dan and Jackson and Mary Luz. To Helen, who I think is online with us perhaps, to Helen, we also think of you today. And many nieces, cousins, and other relatives and friends, we offer you our presence on this day. Because it is the presence of one human being with another human being that allows us to go through these moments of difficulty. 
with some degree of confidence that the world is still with us, even though Julius is not. We offer condolences to you for your loss, and we stand together in sadness and in consolation with you. These occasions of memories are times when memories and emotions will flow back and forth where laughter and tears will intermix as we remember Julius and all that he meant to us. That is how this day is supposed to be. We are indeed saddened at Julius's passing. So I hope that we are comforted by being here with one another, remembering how he influenced and still influences our lives and I would say for good. We are buoyed by the inner joy he carried, by the intellectual spirit that was the hallmark of Julius throughout his life. Well, at least most of his adult life at any rate. I don't know how he was in college. We are optimistic about the future because of the gifts that Julius shared with us during his life. So we are sharing mixed emotions today. And some may see that as a paradox. But I think that Julius would ask us to look beyond always searching for the truth in every situation. Because if anything is true, it is true that there is love in this family. There is love in this community today. And that we are gathering here in that spirit. We do remember Julius. And we hope that Julius will maintain us in the future as we keep him in our hearts. We remember the goodness that was so integral to his heart and soul. We remember his humor, which was understated, but always present. We remember the love that united you and Julius throughout your lives, in which today we acknowledge that death cannot sever. We remember and think about the companionship that you shared with Julius, which continues through life's experiences, and the tenderness of memories. We think about the gifts of his heart and his mind that brought joy. And all of that is now a precious remembrance. For all these and more, we give thanks to God. At this time of sadness, we listen to the voice of our sacred scripture that brings us the ever new message of God's nearness. It tells us of our kinship with the creator in light as in darkness, in joy as in sorrow, in life as in death. A few moments ago, I shared these words with Julius's family in the cemetery. These are words that make up Psalm 15. And let us see how much of Julius we see present in this psalm. Eternal God, who may dwell in your sacred tent, who has the privilege to live on your holy mountain, the one whose walk is blameless, the one who does what is righteous, the one who speaks the truth from his heart, whose tongue utters no slander, who does no wrong to a neighbor and casts no ill repute on others, who despises the wicked and honors those who, fears the, who fear the eternal, who keeps an oath and even when it hurts does not retract, who lends money to the poor without interest, who does not accept bribes against the innocent. He who does these things will never be shaken. If I'll offer the 23rd Psalm in both Hebrew and in English. Mizmor litavi Adonai roi lo ersan binot te shear vitzeni al mei menu. Al mei menuchot yenach aleni. 
nafshi yishove, yishove. Yancheni v'maglei tzedek. Yancheni v'maglei tzedek. Leman shemo. Gam ki eilech begetzal mavet lo irara ki hata imadi shivtecha umishan techa ema yenachamu. Aaron, lefanai, lefanai, shulchan neged zorerai, di shanta vashemen roshi osi revaya. Yirdefuni Kol yemei chayai Kol yemei chayai Veshavti Beveit Adonai Leorech Yami Psalm of David. God is my shepherd, so I lack nothing. God makes me lie down in green pastures, leads me beside still waters, and restores my soul. God leads me in paths of righteousness for the sake of the divine name. And even when I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. In the presence of my enemies, you have prepared a table of sustenance and victory. You have anointed my head with oil, and my gratitude overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the eternal God forever. Those who are not aware, I'm coming down with a cold, and so I'm trying to keep my, my clergy partner safe here. <laughs> um, finally, for at least from our scriptural passages, these words from the beginning of the third chapter of Ecclesiastes about the ephemerality of life and everything that it contains and its fullness. Lakos man, veit lechol chefetz, tachat hashamayim, eit la ledet, veit la mut, eit la tat, veit la akor natua, eit la harog, veit lirpo. Eight leaf rods, the eight leaf not. Eight leaf coat, the eight leaf hook. Eight se fold, the eight record. Eight le hashlich avanim, the eight kenos avanim. Eight la havok. 
ואת לרחוק מחבק. את לבקש ואת לאבד. את לשמור ואת להשליך. את לקרוע ואת לתפור. את לחסות, לחשות, ואת לדבר. For everything there is a season, and a time for every purpose under heaven, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant, and a time to uproot that which is planted, a time to tear down, a time to build up, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to grieve and a time to dance, a time to throw stones and a time to gather stones together, a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing, a time to seek and a time to lose, a time to keep and a time to discard, a time to rend and a time to sow, a time to keep silence and a time to speak. This afternoon we will hear from uh, myself, the cantor obviously, um, and members of Julius's family as we set the intention really for the rest of our lives as we remember him. So I'd like to invite Dave to come and, and offer something at this point, please. This is a day of remembering, and it is a time when each of us who have memories of Julius should begin to think about them. I hope that in the days and weeks to come that you who have memories will be willing to share them with Hildy and with Julius's, the rest of Julius's family, because the more that we bring forth, the more that we are able to 
to offer from our experiences and the, the breadth of experience in this room today uh, and more who couldn't join us today and people who might be with us online, the more that we share, we are able to create a larger picture of Julius, to appreciate him, his persona, his goodness, appreciate him so much more. So please be ready to share those stories when you can. I think each of us who knew Julius will have experienced him in different ways. And actually, yesterday, as I was marveling at the solar eclipse, I was trying to imagine how Julius would react to it. I'm not certain how he'd feel. That is something that few people know. Maybe you all know how that would work. But I think he would be excited. I think he'd offer that mystical and quiet smile of wonderment and awe that he exhibited, both because of the uniqueness of such a celestial phenomenon and because of the beauty and the simplicity of nature at that very moment. From my vantage point, seeing that sliver of sun in the sky was like seeing Julius' smile of contentment when nature, one of his most favorite and satisfying aspects of life, presented to us one of her most brilliant and beautiful events. I think his smile would say it all. There were many things that made Julius happy. One of them was the phenomena of nature. As a child, he loved butterflies. You could stare at a cocoon for half an hour just to revel in the ongoing evolution of that creature's life cycle. Part of his joy was in observing and likely predicting the regularity and beauty of the world. Nature was, I think, uh, Dave, maybe you said it, nature was a happy place for him. He was curious and in constant wonder. And as a scientist, he marveled at many of the phenomena of the natural world. There was the era of his life when he studied the fruit fly. And I'm told that some unfortunately got loose in his house by accident, of course. Uh, but his overall achievements in genetics and biochemistry were motivating factors in his life as he exhibited pure wonder and an inner satisfaction at his contributions to the scientific world. So when he held evening scientific seminar groups at his home, he would delight in the discussion, the give and take, the expressions of technical expertise of his colleagues and the satisfaction of arriving at a conclusion, or not. For Julius, the process of science and nature was a centering activity. With his process, all became right with the world. And again, he would likely smile, that smile that so many of us know. Family was absolutely vital to Julius in his life. He loved his family, Hildy and Jean and Dave, all of their accomplishments. And he was proud of all they came to mean in their lives. His children, his children's spouses, his grandchildren, all of those people, all of you people who mean so much to him and, your, and his nieces and cousins and sister and everyone who means so much to him. I remember, Dave, you telling me that when, when you found your niche in public performing, Julius came to watch you and he was just in wonderment at you. And you said that he would attend and swell with pride in seeing you on stage. But I think that you provided him such love and such goodness at that time. And for him, I think a sense of accomplishment that he has made the world right. And Gene, you were so good about listening to his jokes. <laughs> the good ones and the better ones. <laughs> And Hilda, you were absolutely a foundation for him. He deeply appreciated your presence, your patience, your support, and your going through life's adventures with him, whether it was here in Madison or traveling all over. He loved your presence. He thrilled in your relationship. He simply loved being with you at the dinner table where you, know, you were eating and just one's mere presence share, was able to share the love in those moments. He would breathe a sigh of contentment at being in relationship with all those he loved. You all have stories. Begin to build them up. 
His connection to Judaism was yet another source of comfort for him. Julius grew up in an Orthodox household in his native village of Edelfingen in Germany. I think that Jews were probably not the minority, and Jews were certainly the minority in that place. But for Julius, I think Jewish life was everything. For him and his family, Judaism literally was like mamaloshin, a term that refers not only specifically to the Yiddish language, mamaloshin, but also an overall way of communicating and a deeply instilled cultural expression of one's Jewish soul. And although he determined early on that an orthodox lifestyle did not elevate him as it might for other people, he proudly chose the Jewish cultural pathway. He respected and loved the living and breathing aspects of Jewish communal and intellectual life. For Julius, joy came about through studying with authorities who provided him with intellectual sustenance. And aside from his colleagues, who I know are in the sanctuary today, I need to mention these names of rabbis with whom he studied. I think this was the right name. Louis Levison, who was the rabbi in, in Grand Forks, North Dakota, um, in those times. Uh, rabbi uh, Max Tickton at Hillel here at the University of Wisconsin during his student days. And Rabbi Manfred Swarsensky, our synagogue's first rabbi, who for Julius was one of the few German refugees in town and with whom he had a special connection. Julius loved the Hebrew Bible, where one of his favorite books was the book of Job. Now, Job is the story of a man beset by misfortune who would not blaspheme God, even though that deity was the evident cause of his suffering. The reader, we who read this story, know that God is not the source of this adversity. The culprit was one of God's helper angels. Yet scholars debate long and loud about the meaning and the purpose of Job's hardships seeing Job's steadfast resistance to assigning blame and his remaining faithful throughout his life. Now again, Julius is drawing no parallels to his life at all and the book of Job, because I think that Julius found great joy and great satisfaction from his life. But I think he enjoyed the intellectual discussion of this book and trying to figure out why the heck is it in the Hebrew Bible? But even that I understand. That I understand. Why is it 42 chapters? That's a question for rabbinic students. Uh, <laughs> not important for today. Jewish life for Julius was also to be found in the 55 years of Passover seders he held with family and friends. He grooved on the intellectual discussion and exchange of the seder, debating the concepts evident in the story of Exodus, exacting, extracting, sorry, extracting modern principles and bringing everyone to their places of philosophical growth and strength. I don't know whether he liked Passover foods, yet as Passover begins in two weeks, I know that he and his passion for this holiday of liberation will be sorely missed. And finally, he had a love and respect for work and making meaningful, meaningful contributions to the world. This was another of his supreme values and passions. Science, for him, scientific exploration and the rigor of research, the informed intellectual debate and more, all of these moved Julius as he moved science forward. We also have to know, though, that, well, for him, let me say this, Jean recalls a time when he came to her elementary school class on show and tell days and he would bring Petri dishes to share with the students. He liked Petri dishes. Um, he also came one evening to Club de Wash a local nightclub, uh, where he offered an impromptu talk on science. Uh, yeah, I, I, I hear his focus there, too, was on Petri dishes. <laughs> I think he gave some out to the crowd. I, I'm sure they were clean. But the issue of work, choosing to do what you want in the world and then achieving it and accomplishing it, was so important to Julius, and he would advocate that for anybody here. Now, others will come to this Bema shortly and tell us more about their focused impressions and experiences of their lives with Julius. I was only his rabbi. And yet, he continues to inspire us to take a serious look at our lives and the world because he was determined to march to his own drummer and to see life, science, 
love and Judaism in his own unique ways. Yet his loving, kind, and smart approach to those subjects and to those around him also supports his message that life needs to be led through love and dedication to duty and family. I think one can think of all of that and just smile. I want to invite Carol Litovsky to our Bima, please. Good afternoon. I'm Carol Lotovsky, Julius's first cousin, and I'm going to speak a bit about Julius's early times in Germany and his time in Grand Forks, North Dakota. Julius was born in 1930 in Edelfingen, Germany. Edelfingen is a small village with today's population of only 1,370 folks. It was founded in 1207, had a Jewish population since the Middle Ages. Julius was born to Irma and Adolf Adler and has a sister, Helen, who now lives in Minneapolis. Adolfingen had a synagogue built in 1791. Julius's parents were observant Jews and Julius grew up in this environment. There were 78 Jews in the village. Adolf, his father, had a butcher shop and was a cattle dealer in Adolfingen. Julius had a typical life of play an elementary school until 1935, when Jews were no longer allowed in the public schools. Helen and Julius then took a train to Bad Mergenheim, where they attended a Jewish parochial school. In 1937, Nazis severely damaged the synagogue in Edelfingen. Unrest and terror about for the Jews was unfolding. During this time, Julius's uncles, Max and Leo, were informed that an action to capture Jewish men in Edelfingen was going to take place. Fearful for the lives of their sister Irma, Adolf, Helen, and Julius, they drove their car 68 miles from Stuttgart, Germany to Edelfingen. They did this without lights on the car to avoid detection by roving Nazis. Once they arrived at the Adler home in Edelfingen, they put Irma, Helen, and Julius in their car and again without lights, drove the car 24 miles to Hoabach where Irma's mother, Sophie, lived. Sister Helen told me that at the time, she thought this was a grand adventure, but Julius slept the entire way. <laughs> Meanwhile, Adolf hit in the field. Julius's mother, Irma, had another brother, also named Julius, who early on became concerned with the situation in Germany, made his way to the United States. He was promised a job in Grand Forks, North Dakota. Once he got word from his brothers that things had gotten worse in Germany, he began the process of getting visas so the family could escape. In April 1938, when Julius was about eight years old, the family boarded a ship for the US. At this time, they left behind 47 relatives, all eventually killed by the Nazis. At the funeral of Julius Stern, Julius Adler gave a eulogy and said, Uncle Julius was the Joseph of the family for bringing so many of the family out of the Holocaust. Julius wrote in later years that he imagined tying a string to the pier in Hamburg, Germany and slowly letting it out as he crossed the Atlantic. Julius said, as our boat approached America, all had binoculars peering into the distance. The Statue of Liberty came into view and we shouted with rejoicing. We were scared but full of hope. Julius Stern had purchased a house so the family he brought over would have a place to live. In Julius's eulogy of my father, Max, he reflects on sharing a room with him and felt this was why they were always so close. To make money, Julius's mother with the, helped with the preparation of kosher poultry, and Adolf helped another man in Grand Forks buy cattle. Julius, as a young boy, delivered poultry on his bicycle around Grand Forks. By means of constant work and saving of money, Irma and Adolf were able to buy a small house and open a, neighbor, a, a neighbor, neighborhood grocery store. Julius remained in Grand Forks through graduation from Central High School. 
Grand Forks is on the eastern border of North Dakota and at that time, and still is, very rural. Julius excelled in Grand Forks after rapidly learning English. By the time he was in high a high school senior, he was admitted to Harvard. How far and how quickly Julius had come. He received advice from a pediatrician who was a family friend on how to act in this lofty intellectual arena called Harvard. Irma and Adolf spent nothing on themselves but saved money to provide college educations for Helen and Julius. Julius's visits to see his parents and family were very exciting for his cousins, myself included, growing up in Grand Forks. His life was one grand adventure to us. He traveled, he had an incredible butterfly collection, loved nature, and he listened to us. He gave us full attention. He truly opened up the world for Linda, Larry, Eric, and myself. Gifts were always books. My favorite, which I still have, is called The Family of Man. We went on field trips with Julius, where we searched for cattails, pussy willows, and of course, <coughs> butterflies. We were awed by Julius's educational successes, and he encouraged us to continue our own educations for the sake of learning, not just as a career. Julius spent time with us and his aunts and uncles. A visit to Grand Forks for five days meant visiting all of us every day. Julius never spoke of his own honors and accomplishments, but la rather lived by one of his mother's many folksy expressions. Sufila kufa is kind of gross air. Too much honor is not a big honor. <laughs> Julius was devoted to putting together the genealogy of our family. This began early in his life, continued for many years. With the help of contacts Julius found in Germany and elsewhere, he pieced together family history in Germany and migration. This was well before Ancestry.com or other like sites. Julius wrote out pages of family trees with dates, locations, and occupations. This involved taping together pages of paper to get the width of space needed for all the branches he was covering. Julius used some wonderful sources, including a German teacher and a Lutheran minister. Julius's greatest gift to the family was marrying Hildy. She brought energy, warmth, and additional appreciation of family. We were then blessed with cousins David and Jean, and in time we added Dan, Jackson, and Mary Beth to our family tree. We love you all. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. We'd like to invite David Nelson now to our BIMA. I was a scientific colleague of Julius for many years in the biochemistry department here. Julius loved nature. In his scientific autobiography, he wrote, to me, nature has always been an inspiration. Both the beauty of nature and the science of nature are the things that have dominated my life. I met Julius 50 years ago when I attended a seminar he gave at the Stanford Medical School. The seminar was entitled, How and Why Bacteria Swim. And I remember thinking this was an odd choice of subject for a biochemist. I eventually came to re realize that this was a very unusual man who was not afraid to travel the path less traveled. For 50 years, I watched with admiration as Julius and his lab group chipped away at these questions, how and why bacteria swim, eventually arriving at a detailed molecular picture of bacterial swimming and its regulation, that is, by chemotaxis. I discovered just a few minutes ago that one of his former graduate students is here today wearing a tie that shows the model of chemotaxis that Julius spent 50 years developing. <laughs> this model had profound scientific information, in, uh, implications for far more than just the, the bacteria. The hallmarks of Julius's research were clean and profound thinking the use of very simple tools, elegant experimental design, and impeccable scholarship. His gift for keeping things simple also served him well as a teacher and a writer. 
His lectures and his scientific papers were models of simplicity, clarity, and scholarship. He didn't waste words. He asked for penetrating questions about fundamental issues. Sometimes his questions seemed so simple as to be simple-minded, but almost always it turned out there was a fundamental issue. It, it, as a mentor, Julius was generous of his time and uh, encouragement, and he was invariably kind. He was unselfish in quoting and crediting his graduate students and postdocs scientific contributions. His attention to them brought out the strengths in the graduate students and postdocs, the many graduate students and postdocs that moved through Julius's lab over the years. He modeled high scientific standards with his own rigorous honesty, self-criticism, and willingness to, be, to change his mind. The work on bacterial chemotaxis attracted a wide scientific audience and led many laboratories to join in the study of chemical sensing. Hundreds, probably a thousand scientists now study this field that Julius opened up in bacteria and in animal cells. His leadership in the field has been acknowledged with invitations to lecture all over the world with honorary degrees from several universities, with a named professorship at Wisconsin, with the prestigious International Warburg Medal of, in, in chemistry, of biochemistry, and his early election to the National Academy of Science in the United States. For those many who knew Julius as a friend and colleague, I'm afraid words fail to capture his remarkable capacity for friendship. With his great personal warmth and genuineness, he made one feel valued, encouraged, respected. We are all fortunate to have enjoyed his friendship. He was a great scientist and a wonderful man. We will miss him very much. We now invite Rayla Temin to our BIMA. Thank you for giving me this opportunity to offer some memories of my dear friend Julius, who I am blessed to have known for more than 60 years. I first met Julius in 1961 when he was a new assistant professor in the UW Departments of Biochemistry and Genetics, and I was a graduate student in genetics. Julius had also made friends with Howard Temin, a newly arrived assistant professor at the McArdle Laboratory for Cancer Research, who I also had met through genetics. So Julius, Howard, and I often hung out together, such as for lunch at the Union Terrace. Thus, I was friends with Julius even before he met Hildy, who he married in 1963. Howard and I had married the year before, and then the four of us hung out together for many years, sharing family life, raising our children, celebrating life cycle and holidays and many, many events. For example, we subscribed to concert series together. Once, a very long time ago, we attended a concert at the Memorial Union, which happened to occur on Halloween. We had dinner at Husnu's restaurant on State Street, not paying any attention to the fact that there was this enormous, raucous party <laughs> going on all along State Street. 
As we exited the restaurant to head over to the Union, we were accosted by a rowdy group of revelers who complimented us on our nifty costumes, <laughs> noting that we were dressed up as professors <laughs> in our usual staid long winter coats and hats. We laughed and enjoyed that and many, many other outings and adventures. I will say a bit about two major and very special events led by Julius that were notable highlights, their Passover seders and their Hanukkah parties, organized by that master organizer, Hildy. These multi-generational celebrations started in the Adler home on Wellesley Drive in 1969 and were held annually for 55 years. Julius and Hildy were gracious hosts for the 30 or so of us present. In some of the early years, this included Hildy's mother and aunt. Julius sat at the head of the beautifully set table, and he summoned the often boisterous crowd by ringing a cowbell. <laughs> and then he led the ceremony in a scholarly and thorough and serious manner. David sat at his side, enhancing the music. For the Passover Seder, Julius read from the Haggadah, pointing out special personal features as we move through the steps, such as the family history of their beautiful water pitcher or Seder plate or matzah cover. He called on each participant for his or her turn on the carefully pre-planned program he joked with the kids when they found the afikoman, the hidden matzah, and bargained for it with him. Julius was very interested in the archeological and possible historical bases for the stories that we were reading, and he brought up many questions about it. At Hanukkah, Julius read from the Book of Maccabees in the Jewish Apocrypha. He raised the question, for example, of whether the famous story of the oil lasting for eight days as in fact, is in fact actually part of that history and raised other matters that we debated about. Julius was a thoughtful and interesting and creative leader, and the Seder and Hanukkah parties were festive and joyous events with a lot of hearty singing, really wonderful and happy and fun times at the Adlers. At the conclusion of the Passover Seder, it is the practice to say, as written in the Haggadah, Lishana Haba'ah B'Yerushalayim, next year in Jerusalem, reflecting the long time yearning of the Jewish people to return to their ancient homeland. However, at the Adler Seder, we end non-traditionally with next year in Grand Forks. <laughs> and by now you know why a Julius, born in Germany, came to the US with his family fleeing the Nazis in 1938 when he was just eight years old. They settled in Grand Forks, North Dakota, where their relatives had arrived 50 years earlier. Julius researched and documented his family history among his many, many other interests in nature and others. So as we say a goodbye to Julius, we pay tribute to him and to his formative beginnings. Julius was warm and kind, a gentle and a sweet person, learned, so enthusiastic about life a man who leaves a good name and a truly meaningful legacy. May Julius's memory be for a blessing. And now we'd like to invite uh, Jean and David, who will come up together.
Many years back in college, I wrote a paper for an art therapy class I took. I think the topic was an introduction to my family. My dad really liked it and kept it all these years. He told my mom that he wanted certain parts of it read at his funeral, so here we go. <laughs> my father is a professor in biochemistry at the University of Wisconsin. He came to the United States in 1938 to escape the Nazis in pre-war Germany. He graduated from Harvard with a BA in biochemical science. He received his master's at the UW as well as his PhD. He was a postdoctoral fellow at Washington and at Stanford each for one year. He is a quiet man, a man of few words, which makes it difficult to talk to him. We are opposites in many areas. He is very left-brained and approaches things methodically and logically. I am right-brained and I approach things intuitively and creatively. I can't ever remember having an argument with him despite the varied ways in which we view the world. I love both my parents very much. I am so glad that I was adopted by them. Sometimes I become afraid imagining what it could have been like had I been adopted by a different family, a family that hasn't been as supportive and loving as mine. So now, 25 plus years later, I would write a completely different paper. <laughs> and I'm sure he would be as equally proud of it as the college one. My new paper would also introduce him as a retired biochemistry and genetics professor emeritus from the UW with several degrees, awards, and accolades. It would also talk about his immigration to America, his schooling, and perhaps our past difficulties in understanding each other. But then my paper would pivot because now I understand him so much more. It would go into several paragraphs, maybe even pages, about our mutual love for nature and the outdoors. Some of my earliest memories are of nature and dad. I was searching for a long time for a photo of dad and I canoeing on Lake Mendota through the water lilies. And then I realized there is no picture of that. It was a moment in time and such a strong memory for me that my brain took the picture. And I continue to love canoeing. Seeing the magnolia trees in bloom in the arboretum was also a strong memory. I hated things flying around my head, and the fact that they could sting you was just too much for me at that young age. And that intense dislike of insects flying around one's head is equally strong in his grandson, Jackson. <laughs> but I've grown to learn the importance of bees, and I try to coexist, coexist with them when possible. Dad unfailingly respected nature, including every eight-legged or winged creature that found its way into our house. An upside-down glass with an index card underneath was a common occurrence at the Adlers. All, insect, all insects and critters were brought back outside to live out their lives in the wild. There was even one time a butterfly nut came in, handy, came in as a handy tool to catch a, bat, catch a bat perched on a wall hanging in Dave's room. Dave still hates bats to this day. <laughs> As proud as dad was of his family, I was proud to have a science professor as a dad. I remember in grade school when we would have show and tell, dad would come with enough petri dishes for the whole class and we'd all cough in them or put our hands in them and let them sit for a few days to watch them grow molds and slimes and other yucky things. I thought it was the coolest thing. <laughs> dad used to walk to work just about every day. On the, on the rare days that we would pick him up and drive him home, Dave and I used to go and knock on his window. His office was in the basement, but it had a window to the street level. Sometimes on the weekends, if Dad would go into the lab, we'd have a picnic on the grass in the gardens of Henry Mall, topped off with ice cream at Babcock. Let me tell you how awesome it was that Dad's lab was so cl close to the ice cream store. <laughs> Weekends or early summer evenings would mean walks on Picnic Point. Frogs and ducks and red-winged blackbirds on cattails, or around the marsh, hunts for pretty rocks, pumping the handle for drinking water from the water pump. Family time often meant some sort of outdoor adventure. In his later years, I felt that I understood Dad to a greater degree. I knew his idiosyncrasies, his limitations, and his motivations. And with that further understanding, I realized that the things he loved, he loved with his whole heart. His family, his family history, his research, nature, and learning about Judaism. Dave understood dad in a way that I did not. 
but I had a unique ability to reason with dad when no one else could. <laughs> dad was always interested in others. During his last week, he was far more interested in what was going on with me, Dave, and mom. What's your story? Taking the focus off himself. The Friday before he died, we sat together and enjoyed Beethoven's Ninth Symphony. Words do not always need to be spoken with us. Although he would perk up when I talked of the sandhill cranes in the conservancy or the Canada geese flying so low over our house that you could hear the air move over their wings. I am a much better and more rounded person for having dad as my dad. He will be missed greatly and I will keep his memory and spirit alive in my heart. Hello, <laughs> my name is Dave Adler, and I'm the son of Julius Adler. Thanks so much to all of you for coming to help remember and honor my father. Julius had three loves in his life, nature, Judaism, and family. You've heard my cousin Carol talk about his upbringing in Grand Forks, North Dakota. You've also heard David Nelson's excellent summation of his scientific work and Rayla Temin's wonderful remembrances of Jewish holiday house parties. By the way, this is the tie that he would wear at those parties. <laughs> I'd like to take a moment to talk about how, how I experienced Julius as a father. Kindness, patience, amazement, wonder. From an early age, these facets of my father made a deep and lasting impression. I modeled my behavior after him. I held him and hold him as an example of someone who lives life at an impenetrably deep and sacred level, a level that as a child, was often completely lost on me. <laughs> when I was a little kid, I knew that my father was somehow different from other fathers. I always knew he loved me, but sometimes I had a hard time understanding how he expressed it. If someone called me a bad name at grade school, my father would cheerfully suggest that we look up the offensive term into the unabridged dictionary <laughs> located on a pedestal at the back of the bacteriology library. This verbal deconstruction, he assumed, would surely help me make sense of things. <laughs> if we were stuck at the end of a long line and I complained to him, he would, in, he would intone, the first shall be last. And that was the end of that. <laughs> if I asked him to help me with a math problem, he would request that I bring him the textbook so he could start from the beginning and catch up to where I was. <laughs> After that, I would ask my mom, who would just give me the answer. <laughs> Julius took me to my first rock concert. The Grateful Dead at the Dane County Coliseum in 1978. He made me leave halfway through because he was tired. It was one of the worst moments of my life. My father tried very hard to pass his love of nature along to me. <laughs> Which is pretty funny. <laughs> we would go on canoe trips down the Wisconsin River, and we tried to have fun. <laughs> Ultimately, the trips would end by Julius leaving me with a canoe under a highway bridge for a couple of hours while he hitchhiked his way back to the car. I was eight. <laughs> what I know now, and I didn't know then, was that I was dealing with a very special person. A person who knew no guile, 
who remained innocent and pure all of his life, who was constantly amazed at everything, and who always saw the best in everyone. He was unabashedly joyful, endlessly exuberant, and always filled with wonder. To me, this is living in a state of constant gratitude. Julius was very close with his sister, Helen, my aunt. Helen wanted me to say that in all their years together, she and Julius never fought. They looked forward to speaking regularly on the phone every Sunday. She wanted it known that Julius was, quote, the greatest brother a sister could ever have. My wife, Mary Beth, was also especially close with Julius. When I proposed, she made it clear that she was not interested in getting married unless Julius walked her down the aisle. <laughs> Mary Beth and I had two different marriage ceremonies. The first one was hosted by Hildy and Julius at their apartment in Oakwood. It was beautiful. She was so honored that Julius walked her down the aisle. She and Julius shared a very special moment while they were waiting to start. They both told each other how much they loved each other, and Julius said he was so proud to walk Mary Beth down to me. That meant everything to Mary Beth. I'd like to thank my wife for being such a great comfort to me during this difficult time. I consider myself very lucky to be Julius Adler's son. He was always supportive of and delighted by my musical endeavors. Every time I came home, he would ask for a report. He took great pleasure in knowing that I was doing something that made me happy. I will love and miss him all of my days. Jean and I sang this for my bar mitzvah and my grandmother's funeral, and today we'd like to sing it for dad. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all of thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all of thy mind. And all these words which I command you on this day shall be in thy heart, shall be in thy heart. And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children. And thou shalt speak of them when thou sittest in thy house. When thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest up, and when thou liest down, and when thou liest down, and thou shalt find the matter a sign upon thy hand, and they shall be for frontlets between thine eyes. And thou shalt write them on the doorposts of thy house, and upon thy gates, and upon thy gates, that ye may remember and do all of my commandments, and be holy unto your God. Unto your God, unto your God. As we see, there are a lot of memories, and we know that. Let us take a few minutes of silent prayer now, not simply for ourselves, of course, that's important, but think too of experiences when we shared time with Julius and Hildy, perhaps together,
perhaps separate, but let us take him into our hearts and our memories as we continue to remember him. are stars up above so far away we only see their light long long after the star itself is gone and so it is with people that we love their memories keep shining ever brightly though their time with us is done but the stars that light up the darkest night these are the lights that guide us as we live our days these are the ways we remember, we remember, as we live our days, these are the ways we remember, we remember. Yesh kochavim she'oram magia arza. Rak ka'asher em atzmam abdu ve'enam Yesh anashim shaziv zichram me'ir Ka'asher em atzmam enam Od betocheinu Orot ele ha'mavikim Becheshkat halayim Heim heim shemarim la'adam Et haderech, et haderech As we live our days These are the ways we remember We will shortly conclude this service. A few things before we do that. First, uh, this congregation is invited to be with Hildy this afternoon and her family um, as we 
have a luncheon um, uh, a meal of condolence next door. Um, however, uh, there is a Jewish custom that the family really needs to eat. So we want to invite the family to, I would like to invite the family, that's me, right? Uh, I want to be sure that they eat. So um, please uh, allow the family first to go and have, have lunch, and then everyone can join them afterwards and, and make sure you hold them close. Secondly, tomorrow evening at 7 o'clock um, at Oakwood in the uh, Nakoma Westmoreland room, there will be a Shiva minion. There'll be a time of gathering and worshiping and spending more time with Julius, Julius's family. So um, please bear all that in mind. I think that was all the announcements I needed today. Birth is a beginning, writes the poet, and death a destination. And life is a journey from childhood to maturity and youth to age, from innocence to awareness and ignorance to knowing, from foolishness to discretion, and then perhaps to wisdom from weakness to strength, or from strength to weakness, and often back again, from health to sickness, and we pray to health again, from offense to forgiveness, from loneliness to love, from joy to gratitude, from pain to compassion, from grief to understanding, from fear to faith, from defeat to defeat to defeat until not looking backwards or ahead, we see that victory lies not at some high point along the way, but in having made the journey, step by step, a sacred pilgrimage. Birth is a beginning and death a destination. And life is a journey from birth to death to life everlasting. We invite the community to rise in body or in spirit as now we offer El Malay Rachamin. Male Rachamim Shochen Vameromim Hametzei Menucha Nechona Tachat Kanfei Ashechina Im Kiroshim Oteorim Kezoar Anakia Mazirim Et Nishmat Yom Tov Ben Asher Shehalach Leolamo Ba'al arachamim Yasirehu Beseter Kenafav Leolamim Veitzror Titzror Achaim Et nishmato Adonai Hu Nachalato Yanuach Bishalov Al Mishkavo and Omar Amen. O God, full of compassion, eternal spirit of the universe, grant perfect rest in your sheltering presence along with all the righteous and holy ones to Julius Adler, our loved one who has entered eternity. O God of mercy, let him find refuge forever in the shadow of your wings and let his soul be bound up in the bonds of eternal life. God is now his, his inheritance. May he rest in peace and we say amen. amen. Please join one another in the mourner's Kaddish.
Yitgadal, Yitkadash, Me Raba, Vialma divra hirute, Viam lich malchute, Vahaye hon, Vyome hon, Vahaye de hol bait Yisrael, Vaagala uvisman kariv imru, Amen. Yehe shame Raba, Mevarach le alam ul alme al Maya. Yit barach, Vishtabach, Vit paar, Vit romam, Vit nase. Beit Hadar, Beit Ale, Beit Halal, Shmei de Kudsha Brichu, Leela, Min Kol Bir Chata Veshirata, Tushbechata Venechemata, De Amiran Bealma, Beimru, Amen. Yehe Shlama, Raba, Min Shemaya, Vechayim Alenu, Veal Kol Yisrael, Beimru, Amen. Ose Shalom Bimromav, U Yaase Shalom. Alenu ve al kol Yisrael ve al kol Yoshvei Tevel ve Imeru. Amen.